Welcome to the presentation for Nursing 150. This is presentation. We'll discuss hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. We will also go into the discussion regarding the parathyroids and any disorders of the parathyroid glands as well because they are closely related to the thyroid gland. Um, just to make note that for fall 2016, this is module 5 for Nursing 150. This slide is just a reminder as to anatomically where the thyroid gland is. The thyroid gland is an endocrine gland. It's part of the endocrine system. Hormones secreted from the thyroid gland include T3, T4, and calcitonin. T3 and T4 are the thyroid hormones. Calcitonin is a hormone that aids in the regulation of calcium levels. Hypothyroidism is the first disorder of the thyroid gland that we will discuss. Hypothyroidism is a common treatable disorder in which there's a slow progression of thyroid hypofunction. It is a disease of various causes. It leads to an adequate amount of thyroid hormone being produced and secreted, resulting in a slowing of many body functions and metabolic processes. The clinical manifestations of this disorder of the thyroid gland sometimes goes unnoticed due to the fact that it is a slow onset and progresses slowly. Hypothyroidism occurs more in women than men. It's estimated that as many as 4.6% of the United States population um, has hypothyroidism. The most common worldwide cause of it, so that means in other countries, um, is iodine deficiency. In the United States, where iodine is usually adequate, autoimmune processes are the primary cause of thyroid disease. Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it's a type of primary hypothyroidism, is the most common form of autoimmune thyroid disease. This type of hypothyroidism occurs at least four times more often in women than in men. Typically occurs, but the age of onset is 30 to 60 years of age. Again, hypothyroid um, can be differentiated into primary and secondary causes. The most common primary cause is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is the most common cause of primary hypothyroidism in the United States. Secondary causes are referring to um, a, a different cause outside of the thyroid gland. This would be thyroid surgeries. So um, sometimes thyroid surgeries are done to treat a hyperthyroidism, and this could lead, um, if we remove someone's thyroid, that means that they no longer have the ability to produce their own thyroid hormones. So they would um, go into a hypothyroidism. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the United States, like I said before. This autoimmune form of hypothyroidism results when the body pathologically recognizes thyroid, thyroid antigens as foreign. This leads to a chronic immune response, which eventually leads to atrophy of the thyroid follicles. These are some um, other part of the endocrine system that it can affect thyroid function. Of course, the thyroid gland is a part of it. Normal thyroid function is required for every metabolic process in the human body. Growth and de development, protein synthesis, and cell metabolism are all dependent on the adequate supply of thyroid hormone to the peripheral tissues. The pituitary gland is responsible for secreting the thyroid stimulating hormone that acts as a stimulant for the thyroid gland to increase the levels of thyroid hormone circulating. The hypothalamus works in collaboration with the thyroid gland in the regulation of serum calcium levels. The diagnosis of hypothyroidism is made by measuring serum TSH 
and T3 and T4 hormone levels. Testing a patient's iodine levels can determine if an iodine deficiency is related to the hypothyroidism. Vital signs can indicate, um, can help to confirm if a patient is experiencing a hyper or hypothyroidism. The diagnosis is usually made based upon the clinical presentation of the patient, which includes the vital signs in the BMI. Vital signs with a hyper thyroidism patient would be much more apparent um, than the hypothyroid patient. The BMI for a hypothyroid patient is going to be increased. Um, fine needle aspiration, if a thyroid nodule is identified, can help us to determine the cause of the nodule. We can determine if it's a thyroid cancer or perhaps just a thyroiditis. Ultrasound of the thyroid also gives us a picture of the nodule. Um, if someone if a provider determines that they feel like they palpate a nodule on the thyroid, an ultrasound can show us more information regarding whether there actually is a, a nodule and how big it is. What to look for in a patient to determine if they have a hypothyroidism. Typically, they complain of weakness and fatigue, and it's a profound fatigue and weakness, like um, just like they feel like they can't get up off the couch. Cold intolerance unexplained weight gain. So again, it's unexplained. Like if they, they continue to have a poor appetite and gain weight, that's an unexplained weight gain. Constipation, they can have goiter, slow speech, decreasing mental stability, cool, dry, coarse, flaky skin. They have dry, sparse hair and thick, brittle nails. Other indications include a slow pulse rate, anorexia, abdominal distension, menorrhagia, which means an a, a, a abnormal menstrual cycle, decreased libido, infertility, and tension tremor, and a delayed reflex reaction time. This is all related to the fact that they are very hyper, hypo, hypometabolic due to the fact that they have low thyroid hormones circulating. Severe hypothyroidism in adults is called myxedema. It's characterized by edema of the hands, the face, the feet, and the paraorbital tissues. Myxedema coma, a medical emergency, is a diminished level of consciousness associated with severe hypothyroidism. It typically occurs in an untreated hypothyroidism. Precipitating events include infections and discontinuation of thyroid supplements. Signs and symptoms of myxedema coma include hypothermia, hypoventilation, hypotension, hypoglycemia, and coma. Essentially what happens is the patient's metabolic rate in an untreated or a very severe hypothyroidism. This can happen if someone stops taking their hypothyroidism medication as well. Basically, they just have such a slow metabolic rate that they begin to have um, slowed cellular metabolism resulting in tissue and organ failure. The mortality rate of mix a patient in myxedemia coma is, is extremely high, and this condition is a life-threatening emergency. Myxedema can coma can be caused by a variety of events. Nursing care for a patient um, in myxedemia coma Maintain the paint and airway, of course, always the first thing. Replace fluids with IV, normal, or hypertonic saline as prescribed. Um, and this is all listed in a chart in your book. Um, we're going to give that levothyroxine, which is that synthetic form of the thyroid hormone supplement. We're going to give it IV. Um, we're going to give it IV because the patient needs it very quickly and they need it to work very rapidly. Um, Give corticosteroids as prescribed. This is decreases the inflammation. Check the patient's temperature hourly. This is because they have that hypothermia. Monitor blood pressure hourly, again, due to the hypotension. Cover the patient with warm blankets. Monitor for changes in mental status. Turn every two hours and institute aspiration precautions, which would mean elevating the head of the bed and not giving them thin liquids until we're we're 
sure that they are able to swallow, that they are alert enough to swallow. These are some common nursing diagnoses that can be related to a patient with hypothyroidism. So you need to think about your interventions that would um, be nursing interventions apply applicable to these nursing diagnoses. For impaired gas exchange, it's going to be um, things like monitoring their respirations, monitoring their O2 sat, um, applying oxygen if needed, assessing their lung sounds, their breath sounds, and perhaps avoiding giving them any um, sedation unless absolutely necessary due to the fact that in a hypothyroid state they're already um, maybe mentally with the low metabolic rate so it's only going to decrease that more so we have to be very careful with that. Hypotension is something we need to monitor for. Um, we need to make sure that we treat it appropriately if it does occur. Monitor their mental status um, frequently and also monitor for those signs and symptoms of a mixed coma. Education for a patient diagnosed with hypothyroidism is always important. Explain all medications. Um, in this case, it's typically levothyroxine, which is a synthetic form of a thyroid hormone. Since they um, hypothyroidism means that you do not have sufficient amounts of the thyroid hormone, we're going to give them a um, synthetic form of it to replace it. Um, education about this is instruct the patient to check their pulse at least twice a week and stop the thyroid supplement and notify the physician if the pulse is greater typically um, usually greater than 100 but it may be a rate that the doctor gives them specifically explain that the healthcare professional should be notified about conditions that um, indicate that they might be getting into a hyperthyroidism we can overshoot the dose of this med, so we have to be careful and we have to explain to them how to monitor for that. Explain that ongoing medical assessment is required to check their thyroid function and that the medications may lead to a hyperthyroidism despite the patient's underlying hypothyroidism. Teach the patient about the thyroid gland as well as complications such as heart disease and edema. Um, they really need to just be aware about their situation and, and why they need to take this thyroid hormone replacement forever. Um, stopping it in cold turkey could lead to a life-threatening situation such as myxedema coma. Levothyroxine is typically given in the morning to enhance utilization. Um, the patient is initially given a low dose and then increased as necessary until the desired effect is achieved. Levothyroxine, the, um, it, the absolute effects of it does not show up right away. Typically, we check initially we check hormone levels about every six to eight weeks until their hormone levels are leveled off. Um, so basically, what that means is like we can't give them um, we can't give them a week to take the med and then check their hormone levels because we're not going to see the um, the desired effect of the medication yet. It takes it a little while to get on board in the patient's body and to maintain their hormone levels. The patient will gradually show um, a change in their situation and they need to understand they need to continue to take their med um, even when they begin to feel better. Lifelong, lifelong thyroid replacement therapy is usually required. These are some questions just to ask yourself to check your learning. Um, question number one is basically the Hashimoto's thyroiditis is um, the most prevalent type of hypothyroidism, and that's an autoimmune disorder. Characteristic sign of severe or long-standing hypothyroidism is myxedema. Most tissues and organs are affected by the low metabolic rate caused by hypothyroidism. Cellular energy is decreased. The metabolites that are compounds of proteins and sugars build up inside the cells. The, this buildup causes an edema, which is called myxedema. The edema caused by this changes the patient's appearance. Non-pitting edema forms everywhere, especially around the eyes and the hands and feet. 
and between the shoulder blades. The tongue thickens and the edema forms in the larynx, making the voice husky. Okay, now we're gonna switch gears and talk about the opposite of hypothyroidism. We're gonna talk about hyperthyroidism, which is a common clinical condition characterized by the excessive secretion and synthesis of one or both of the thyroid hormones, T3, T4. Thyrotoxicosis is a term that is typically used interchangeably with the word hyperthyroidism. It's basically just occurring to a condition that means that the thyroid gland has been toxically effective or it is inflamed, causing to an overproduction of the thyroid hormones. The excessive thyroid hormone effects on the body tissues results in alterations in growth, metabolism, and development. Sometimes they are mistaken for psychiatric illness. Hyperthyroidism often occurs spontaneously and can result from the excessive intake of thyroid hormones. Graves disease is by far the most common cause of spontaneous hyperthyroidism in the United States. It is an autoimmune disorder characteristic by autoreactive antibodies. Um, it account, Graves' disease accounts for 80 to 90 percent of hyperthyroid cases, um, peaking in young adults aged 20 to 40 years old. One thing I wanted to bring up um, in researching hyperthyroidism in your book, um, this statement here is found in Iggy, your book, and it actually is not true that I can find anywhere else in any other book. Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder. It ha I cannot find any relation to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is only, in any other book, any other reference that I can find, is only related to hypothyroidism. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that because I did find that statement in your book. I cannot, I've never heard that and I can't find that anywhere else in any other resources that I have. So basically, typically, the major causes of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is autoimmune. Graves' disease is essentially the one that is related to a hyperthyroidism. It is also an autoimmune disorder. There are some other types of thyroiditis, which is an inflammation of the thyroid gland that are related to hyperthyroidism. There's toxic multinodular goiter. Um, it's a common thyroiditis. It accounts for about 15 to 20% of hyperthyroidism cases. This type of goiter is more common in older adults and is a com compilation of chronic and active nodular goiter. Hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism patients can both experience a goiter. Um, hypothyroidism goiters are typically related to an iodine deficiency. Hyperthyroidism goiters are typically related to a thyroiditis. Patients with hyperthyroidism present with signs and symptoms of a hypermetabolic state due to the increased levels of thyroid hormone circulating. These symptoms um, are an increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased temperature. They have weight loss despite being hungry and eating all the time. They have excessive sweating, flushing, and warm skin. Ocular manifestations include something called exophthalmus. This condition is due to increased secretions of a, an acid, an orbital fat accumulation, and inflammation, and edema of the orbital contents. The individual may experience irritation, pain, photophobia, blurred vision, and decreased visual acuity, acuity. Heat intolerance and sweating are two classic signs of Graves' disease. The typical um, thyroid hormone levels um, assist in the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Not sure why this is hypothyroid. I just saw that. It's actually, this is still talking about hyperthyroid. Um, 
And these are the lab tests that are related to a hyperthyroidism. T3, T4, T8, TSH, of course. A thyroid scan to determine, especially if a patient has a, has nodules or a goiter, to kind of just help us determine and, um, and confirm that diagnosis. Non-surgical management of a patient with hyperthyroidism, specifically with Graves' disease, Options are antithyroid medications, radioactive iodine, and surgery. Again, if those if the non-surgical therapies do not are not effective. Typically, non-surgical interventions are the are what is the first choice. However, if a um, thyroid gland is extremely enlarged and is pressing on other structures in the neck, then surgical management might be the only thing that we can do. There are two antithyroid drugs that are use, being used mostly now. Um, one being propy, I can't even say this one, propylothyrosyl. It's otherwise known as PTU. Um, that's an antithyroid medication. It is likely um, started in doses of 50 to 150 milligrams three times a day. The dosage is titrated every three to four weeks based on the thyroid hormone levels. It may take two to eight weeks to see the therapeutic response to the antithyroid medication. Another antithyroid medication that might be seen is MMI or methamazole. These drugs are not to be um, taken for long-term use. They were not meant to be. Once the patient has achieved a euthyroid state, which means they have a depressed thyroid, the frequency of follow-up visits is extended every four to six weeks, um, and they monitor them. If the TSH and free T4 and T3 remain stable during this time, um, they'll, follow, they'll extend their follow-ups Common adverse reactions to antithyroid medications include rash, itching, um, muscle pain, which may occur in 1-5% to 5 of patients. A rare but adverse effect is a granulocytosis or an aplastic anemia. Um, it can affect the liver in some patients. Radioactive iodine is one of the treatments of choice for hyperthyroidism in the United States especially in older adults that may have adverse effects of the antithyroid medications. The radioactive iodine is administered orally. It concentrates in overacted thyroid cells where it emits radiation causing inflammation and the ultimate destruction of the pathologic cells that's causing the hyperthyroidism. Radioactive iodine therapy is contraindication, contraindicated in pregnancy. Um, women receiving radioactive iodine therapy should refrain from becoming pregnant for four to four months after therapy. T4, T3 levels should be checked monthly for three months after the administration of the radioactive iodine in patients receiving it. Surgery may be indicated in some cases of hyperthyroidism, specifically if it is someone who has such an inflamed or enlarged thyroid gland that it is compressing on um, the, the neck and causing a problem with the airway. It may be also considered for cosmetic reasons and for patients who have failed other treatment options. One other thing to mention before we go on some hyperthyroid patients may require treatment for their tachycardias and palpitations and high blood pressures. Um, this is typically treated with beta blockers um, because they can slow the heart rate and decrease the blood pressure. But we have to make sure that we do treat that so that the patient um, does not become so hypertensive or so tachycardic that they go into a cardiovascular arrest. Depending on the patient's condition, they may have to remove all of the thyroid gland or just partial thyroid gland removal. After a total thyroidectomy, patients must take lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. 
This is typically a very minimally invasive surgery now. The parathyroid glands can sometimes be affected and the laryngeal nerves can sometimes be affected by these surgeries. So that is part of our uh, nursing management for a patient who has a thyroidectomy. Monitoring for complications are the most important nursing action after thyroid surgery. Monitoring vital signs frequently. Assess the patient's level of comfort. Use pillows to support the head and neck. Place the patient in a semi fowler's position and avoid any positions that cause very a lot of neck extension. Give pain medications as needed. Assisting, of course, with the coughing and deep breathing. And maintaining their airway is really a very important piece of this because they've now had surgery in their neck and near their trachea, and we need to make sure that they don't have any complications from that. Thyroid surgery can lead to hemorrhage as well, respiratory distress, and parathyroid gland injury can result in a hypocalcemia, which is a low serum calcium level. Tetany is a hyperexcitability of the nerves and muscles, and this is indicative of a hypocalcemia, a low calcium level. We also monitor them for damage to the laryngeal nerves, which could be hoarseness or an, the inability to speak. The other thing that we mo monitor for is something called thyroid storm. Thyroid storm is a life-threatening situation, and we'll talk about that in these slides coming up. So essentially, a lot of nurses like to say after a thyroidectomy, they're on the storm watch. They're doing the weather check for the night, the storm watch. Um, watch for signs of thyroid storm. In doing this, you're going to check for intake and output. And basically what the thyroid storm is means that the patient is becoming excessively, it's a severe form of hyperthyroidism, and it's a very, very hypermetabolic state to where their temperature gets excessively high and we can no longer control it. It can get to a life-threatening level, their temperature can, before we can control it. We'll need to closely monitor their blood pressure because their blood pressure can get life-threatening um, levels. It can get so high with a thyroid storm. And it also, their heart rate can get excessively high in a thyroid storm. And this is just, again, because of that excessive um, hyperthyroidism. Going back to the hypocalcemia that can result from a thyroidectomy, um, a low calcium level can affect the functioning of the heart muscle as well, so that's why we're monitoring for those hypocalcemia issues. Those can occur due to um, the edema in the operative area, which can include the parathyroid hormone from releasing being released into the bloodstream. This results in a low serum calcium level that can lead to tetany. The symptoms include numbness and tingling on the fingertips and toes and around the mouth. There are a couple of um, assessments that nurses do in order to determine if tetany and hypocalcemia exist. Chef talk sign is, a, is positive in a hypocalcemia and it's abnormal spasm of the facial muscles elicited by light taps on the facial nerve. Trousseau sign may also be positive. Trousseau signs can be assessed by um, taking a blood pressure cuff and pumping it up on a patient's arm. You place the blood pressure cuff on their arm and you pump it up on the upper arm. Um, and a positive result will be seen um, with hypocalcemia. And basically the, the hand starts to tremor as you pump up the blood pressure cuff. So again, these are signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. Chef, this is some German, I guess, doctor that came up with this. this is why it's called Chef Talk Sign. And true, let me make sure I spell this right, true, so sign. I remember this is the cheek because it's a C. And then this is uh, this is the, the triceps, kind of, if you, you put your blood pressure cup on your triceps. 
these are both positive in a patient who has a hypocalcemia. Just going to kind of briefly mention hyperparathyroidism and hypoparathyroidism. Hyperparathyroidism involves overactivity of the parathyroid glands. And remember, these sit posteriorly to the thyroid gland, so they're in the neck as well, but posterior to the thyroid gland. Cause of hyperparathyroidism um, may be primary hypertrophy of one or more of the parathyroid glands. It may be as a result of chronic renal failure or other, um, other body system failures in the body. There is a rare occurrence of a parathyroid carcinoma, which could cause this to occur. Hyperparathyroidism usually occurs in adults between 30 and 70 years of age. It occurs twice as often in women. Clinical manifestations is hypercalcemia. The hyperparathyroid um, hormone is associated with your calcium levels. This occurs as calcium leaves the bone and accumulates in the bloodstream. So remember to know your normal calcium levels. Typically, I believe your book now says 9 to 10.5 is your normal calcium level. It's important to understand that. It's also important to understand that calcium levels can affect cardiac muscle activity. So it can be a life-threatening situation. Treatment for a hyperparathyroidism um, typically ends up being a removal of the parathyroid gland. Hypoparathyroidism occurs when there is a decreased level of the parathyroid hormone in the bloodstream. This results in a decreased level of serum calcium. So it makes sense if you have not enough hypo. Uh, or I'm sorry, if you have not enough parathyroid hormone, you have not enough calcium. If you have too much of the parathyroid hormone, you have too much calcium. So it, they're, they're related that way. Non-surgical management of both of these disorders, um, a lot of it is focused on correcting the calcium levels. In hypoparathyroidism, a patient will need supplements. Um, sometimes IV calcium is given. They will also need vitamin D supplements to um, assist with the absorption and um, the utilization of the calcium supplements. This concludes the video um, voiceover presentation for Module 7 regarding the thyroid gland and the, the parathyroid gland. The following slides include some case studies and some questions regarding the content that was just covered. I highly encourage that you try to do those on your own. Um, the, question, the answers to the questions can be found in the comment section of the PowerPoint that's posted and the additional resources.